Devout Muslims long to go on pilgrimage. But for Ismaili Muslims, the religious highlight of a lifetime is to set eyes on the face of their spiritual leader, the Aga Khan. These are troubled times. Islam is at odds with itself and the West. Too often, extremists call the shots. For many Muslims, the Aga Khan is a voice of moderation, a voice of reason, a voice of an Islam that talks about pluralism, of diversity. He ranks amongst the foremost leaders in the Muslim world who are seriously thinking about dialogue between civilizations and dialogue between religious and cultural communities. Should he not succeed, it means that the extremes on both sides have prevailed and won, and that is going to leave us in chaos. He is a very private man who only rarely gives interviews. In the year of his 50th jubilee, this is the story of the Aga Khan and his followers. The noble and peaceful religion of Islam is not a monolith, but a mosaic with many different branches. Of the world's 1.4 billion Muslims, less than 15% live in Arab countries or the Middle East. Scattered across 30 countries, from China to Canada, there are at least two main branches of Ismaili Muslims, of whom perhaps 15 million follow the Aga Khan. He was only 20 when he became the Imam, his people's religious leader. His followers regard him with a reverence that some Muslims see as un-Islamic. Do they see the Aga Khan as the manifestation of God's grace uh, to humankind? Yes, they do. He's our Imam. We are his followers. Without his blessings, I don't believe anything would move. I believe that what he tells me is what I should uh, accept and follow. He's looking after our future. He's guiding us secularly and spiritually. Uh, do they look at uh, the Aga Khan as God, as Allah? Uh, no, uh, they do not. Throughout their history, they have been persecuted and often seen as heretics by some fellow Muslims. They don't take the Quran as it is, and they don't abide by the practices shown in the Quran. All uh, communities in Islam will have their friends and their uh, people who are less well disposed. The faith has many, many different communities, as in the Christian world. If you ask uh, a Russian Orthodox what he thinks of the Catholic Church, he, you might not get the sort of answer that Christian. <laughs> you would think is, uh, let's say, ecumenical. Unlike other Muslims, Ismailis pray three times a day, not five. Outsiders cannot pray with them, but Ismaili women do. In our mosque, we all share the same hall. We, 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 we gather to pray together, which is as it should be. That matters quite a lot to me, because it says we're one under heaven in the eyes of God. In most mosques, as here in Jordan, women are kept out of sight. Sunni Muslims, for instance, telling me they cannot imagine that men and women could be praying side by side and with the women unveiled. Ismaili women are seen as equals in every aspect of life. 
there's a great deal of uh, emphasis placed on women's education and uh, the general advancement of women in society. In Ismaili schools, boys and girls receive equal opportunities. There has been a tendency in parts of the Islamic world to see education as a trampoline to let women take positions in society which the Muslim world or Muslims might consider inappropriate. Every morning I get up literally and I thank Tiaga Khan because the only difference between me and many women is I have an education. These young boys belong to a fundamentalist madrasa in northwest Pakistan. Prayers start at four in the morning. Well, I think in the very conservative areas of the Muslim world, you have a tremendous emphasis on rote learning. Young children are required to memorize the uh, Quran in its totality. But the Ismailis and other Shias too, have always had a much more a rationalizing approach, which is that behind the words of the Quran, there are spiritual meanings which have to be understood in the context of different times. I would go back uh, to the time of the Prophet, where the notion of uh, intellect is very, very powerful indeed. What we're trying to do is to bring this notion of intellect as part of faith forwards in what we're, what we're trying to achieve. For Ismailis, faith, intellect, and social improvement go hand in hand. So the Aga Khan devotes his time and resources to hospitals, universities, schools, and reducing poverty. But this can put him at odds with those Muslim fundamentalists who fear he is trying to propagate the Ismaili faith. There are groups, right-wing Sunni groups, who fear that the Aga Khan's uh, economic development efforts and education efforts in northern Pakistan, uh, the building of schools, the building of hospitals, is part of some sort of plot that he's trying to take over that part of the country. There are mullahs uh, who come out of those madrasa schools who say Ismailis aren't Muslims. I believe that we have never faced a great, greater threat. And by we, I mean not just Ismailis, I mean Islam itself. We have never had such internal chaos and external threats coming at the same time. It must keep him awake at night to imagine what the next 50 years holds. Will they wipe us out? The Ismailis believe that the man who became their 49th Imam in 1957 is a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. But Ismaili history has been shaped by persecution and sometimes bloodshed. After the Prophet's death, the burning issue was whether Muhammad's role as a spiritual guide should pass to his own family or his loyal followers. Two civil wars divided the Muslim world between the Sunnis, who are the overwhelming majority, and the Shias. The main difference between the Sunnis and the Shias is that the Sunnis basically look back to the custom and practice of the Prophet Muhammad. The Ismailis are a minority branch of Shia Islam. Shias believe that in addition to the Prophet's practice, you have to have guidance from the Imams. In the case of the Ismailis, that guidance comes exclusively from um, the, the Imam of the Ismailis, who is the Al Khan. The Ismailis' history has made them who they are. 
a persecuted minority within Islam, they came into their own in 969 of the Common Era. Seen here with Britain's Prince Charles, the Aga Khan is opening an exhibition of his family's extraordinary collection of Islamic art. Many of the most beautiful objects were sponsored by his own ancestors 1,000 years ago in Cairo. Well, first of all, Cairo was built by my ancestors, so it has a special place, obviously, in our history. Cairo was the capital of the Fatimid Empire. Ruled by the Aga Khan's ancestors, it was one of the pinnacles of Islamic civilization. For the first time in Muslim history, the Shia were able to establish their own independent state, which eventually turned into a very large empire, covering not only North Africa, um, but parts of Sicily, of Europe, um, and for a short period of time, also Mecca and Medina. The glories of the Fatimid era include Al-Azhar, the world's oldest university. In this enlightened age, the arts flourished, and so too did philosophy and theology. In Fatimid times, you have Ismaili philosophers affirming, in a way, that uh, religious truths can be found in many different cultural systems, that religious truth is not exclusive to one cultural system. Like Ismailis today, the Fatimid Empire was a beacon of learning and a model of religious tolerance. Egypt had a much larger Christian population and quite a big Jewish population. It was a very pluralist society where Christians, uh, Jews, uh, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims all worked together for the betterment of the empire. They never really tried to convert the majority of the Egyptian population to Ismailis. But in 1171 of the Common Era, an army led by Saladin himself advanced on Cairo and overthrew the Fatimid Empire. The Ismailis took refuge in mountain fortresses in Persia and Syria. Hopelessly outnumbered, some undertook suicidal missions to kill enemy leaders, including a crusader's commander. Part history, part legend. These so-called assassins were misnamed after the Arab word for hashish. The assassins had been accused of performing murders, of taking drugs, uh, of jumping off cliffs uh, in their dedication and devotion and instruction to their imam. In the end, their fortresses fell and most were wiped out by the grandson of Genghis Khan. For the next 500 years, it seemed as if the Ismailis had disappeared from history. The Ismailis and their faith had not been exterminated. Instead, they had blended in with their neighbors in Persia, Syria, and India, hiding their identity, praying in secret. To this day, outsiders are usually not allowed to witness their religious services. It was 500 years before Ismailis showed their faces again. This photo, taken in the mid-1800s, shows the 46th Imam. The Shah of Iran had granted him the title of Aga Khan, meaning Commander-in-Chief. After an abortive uprising, he fled to Afghanistan. In 1877, the present Aga Khan's grandfather was born in the part of British India that is now Pakistan. Perhaps nobody has had more influence on the Aga Khan's life than his grandfather. Only seven years old when he succeeded, that little boy would go on to create the Ismaili community as we know it today. He really decided at a very young age to go the whole way to modernize his community as fast and furiously as, as he could. He noticed very early on that while the vast majority of Indians, the Hindus, were being educated uh, through proper educational systems, many of the Muslims were still living uh, in rural areas and were not getting access to proper education. 
At that time, a lot of progressive-minded Muslims realized that to improve the social conditions of Muslim people, uh, it was better to go with the flow of British power than to try to resist it. The grandfather decided that girls should be educated and that if there's a girl and a boy in a family and there's only enough money to educate one, you educate the girl because she brings up a family. And he decided, he was quite right, that if women got educated, uh, modernity and progress was incredibly fast. Just how well the Ismaili community had prospered became clear when on his jubilee anniversary, they weighed him in gold, then diamonds, and finally platinum. Dressed in traditional ceremonial robes, which he wore nearly 60 years ago when he first met Queen Victoria, His Royal Highness acknowledges the greetings of the gathering. He may have been a former president of the League of Nations, but the image of a man who was quite literally worth his weight in gold fixed itself in the Western imagination. You have the reputation of being one among the six richest men in the world, which is obviously a very nice thing to be if it's true. I should consider it as a great, very great dishonor to be so rich as all that. Of course, I, I have the control of what is the funds of the imamate, and I certainly receive very large sums, but, the great, the, but by far the greater part of it I spend on various other objects with, that are not personal. A famous owner and breeder of thoroughbred racehorses, enormously rich and much married, the third Aga Khan relished his status as elder statesman and bon vivre. Wealth is fine, wealth creation and having a kind of fulfilled earthly life, including sensual pleasure, is very much part of Islam. He was a, a seeker after publicity. Uh, he enjoyed the fun of it. The Aga Khan's son and heir, the dashing Ali Khan, was a decorated war hero, much admired for his work for the Ismaili community. But his love of beautiful women, thoroughbred horses, and fast sports cars attracted the wrong headlines. His first marriage was to the English society beauty Joan Guinness, mother of the present Aga Khan and his brother. That marriage ended in divorce. Subsequent romances culminated in his wedding to Hollywood's hottest sex symbol. Valerie near Khan was recently the center of attraction for all filmgoers, for it was here that Rita Hayworth's wedding took place. The wedding had created world interest. Privacy was impossible. But then that's always the lot of a film star, especially if she marries a prince. It was never clear what the father made of his son's second marriage. But the old man remained fond of Ali Khan's first wife, Joan, and kept in close touch with her son, Prince Karim. <laughs> well, uh, my, my, as I said before, in a sense, my father was, was, uh, was an elder brother to me. I say, saw him occasionally. I saw him during the holidays. Uh, my grandfather was more the senior figure in the family with whom you discussed uh, what you were doing at school and not doing at school, what you were doing at university, not doing at university. And it was a very different relationship and he was very much the head of the family. You've been at uh, Harvard University for three years. W what do you study? Uh, Oriental history. Oh, yes. And it's a, it's a wonderful subject to study in college because you get a chance to get the religious background as well as the political and social background. I'll tell you one thing about Karim. We thought there was something wrong with him. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke. And we were wild. Everybody was wild in those days. Nobody worked. Well, he did. And he was a very serious young man. In 1957, at the age of 79, the Aga Khan died. They would bury him in Egypt, the land of his Fatimid ancestors. 
But when they opened his will, the world was in for a shock. Aga Khan died in 1957. Everyone expected his glamorous son, Ali Khan, to succeed him. In his will, Sultan Muhammad Shah had said that he wanted somebody to lead the Ismaili community and to become Imam of the community who had grown up in an atomic age and who was young. When the will was read, it was found out that it was not Ali Khan that expected to succeed him as Imam, but actually Ali Khan's son, the present Imam, Kareem Aga Khan. And for many Ismailis, this was really a surprise. 20-year-old Aga Khan IV proclaims the start of his reign. In his predecessor's words, the Ismaili sect needs a modern-minded young leader to cope with the problems of an atomic world. Ali Khan went on to serve as vice president of the United Nations General Assembly, but tragically, not for long. I think uh, Ali Khan's father knew very well what he was doing, and I thought it was a very wise choice. And as it turned out to be, it, it was a difference of two years. Uh, he would have been Naga Khan for two years because the accident would have happened anyway, I think. So. Two years later, Ali Khan died in a high-speed head-on car crash near Paris. The next year, Prince Kareem decided to allow the American filmmaker Bob Drew to make a documentary about him and his work. He was a spiritual leader. At the same time, the Aga Khan was a, an athlete. He was a uh, Olympic class skier. It was double-edged. On the one hand, of course, he inherits immeasurable wealth huge power, most eligible bachelor in the world, wonderful looking, great athlete, all these things, fantastic. You think this is king of the universe. And the women, the girls, uh, reacted a little bit the way I've seen the girls react to John F. Kennedy. He was a shining star for them. So on the other hand, Terrific responsibility. Suddenly, his freedom to enjoy his youth was, in a sense, taken away from him. From that moment onwards, he was working a 12, 16 hour day. His passion for skiing led him to meet his future wife, the British model Sally Croker Poole. Lady James, you've become a Muslim. Yes, I have. Has that been difficult? No, it wasn't difficult for me to at all because I wanted to do it. And um, I'm very happy about it and happy to be at ease. Married in a lavish ceremony in Paris, they had three children and stayed together for 27 years. But neither this nor a second marriage was to last. They want their imam to be happy. I remember once talking to a very senior Ismaili when he was divorcing his first wife. His comment I found actually rather, rather moving. He said, the Imam has been wounded. And there is a sense that emotional wounds have perhaps affected him. Uh, he is not a playboy, it's a completely misunderstood uh, role that he has. He does not, and perhaps has not, had the energy, time, uh, to give to his family um, uh, because of his commitment to his bigger family, uh, which is maybe 10, 15 million people. Right from the start, the young Aga Khan undertook a punishing schedule. Here, he is seen arriving in Kenya. The Aga Khan will go to the mosques of the Ismailis to give them the spiritual communion that only his presence can evoke. On 
Almost a lifetime later, the faithful still remember the impact his visit had on them. They saw me in behind everybody else at the back of the, the room, and they said, Akbar, come and sit next to me. Yes, I've seen that. Fifty years ago, the young Akbar was needing advice about his life and career. Akbar has never seen this film before. I think you have to think now, what is the decision for him to take if you make him? Probably they may think they will uh, just see things, well, why don't you uh, maybe they... <laughs> the way he captures your, your heart, I think that's all you need is one time, such an occasion to feel forever. had become Aga Khan at a time of epic and sometimes wrenching change in the world. Uncertain times can result in instability and violence. Okay, we were at the eve of decolonization. We were at a time of bitter, bitter conflict on the, in the Cold War environment. So these were all situations that I, I, I entered <laughs> rather young. In 1972, the young Aga Khan faced his first crisis in the ample shape of Uganda's military tyrant, Idi Amin. It would be a matter of life and death. In 1972, his Malis were threatened again. Uganda's dictator Idi Amin was whipping up racial hatred against East Asians. What was it like meeting Idi Amin? Well, I mean, he was, frankly, on the very extreme limits of sanity. And how did you handle that? You couldn't. You couldn't. The times I saw him, you tried to get him to focus on real issues, and he would slide off into other issues. You couldn't get clarity on anything. I think the, the situation there was that there was enough forewarning of what was to come that uh, I was able to put a number of things in place. A curious combination, killer and clown. Amin's slogan was, Uganda for the Ugandans. That meant East Asians had to leave the country within 90 days. This propaganda film captures the mood of the time. Uganda is at war, economic war. The imperialists and their agents have been kicked out of their seats, and Ugandans have come out whole hungry. Ismaili businesses and property were seized at a fraction of their real value. Or however rich or poor you were, it didn't matter. You would only get a thousand dollars, and that's all we got. It was later discovered at Aga Khan's temple that they had been used as money hideouts as well as for prayers. Well, we heard on the radio the Tudia Min said that we had to go. It was most probably their religion that sowed the seed of isolation from the general public. I couldn't understand at that time why my family would have to leave because that was our home. When we arrived at uh, Entebbe, the scene was really, really chaotic. Very chaotic condition, but anyway, finally, we boarded and we left the country. Uganda's once prosperous Ismailis had become stateless refugees. The Aga Khan had to persuade foreign leaders to give them shelter. And I was very fortunate in the sense that I had a strong personal relationship with President Kenyatta. I had a strong personal relationship with Prime Minister Trudeau, who after all was a, a global statesman. And I said to these uh, statesmen, if a crisis occurs, can you help? And both said yes. He was fantastic. He got Trudeau lined up to airlift everybody who had Ugandan passports, Ismailis who had Ugandan well, passports. Backlash, but I think the general principle of Canada hate, uh, helping people in need and distress uh, is accepted by all Canadians. The aim His response to that issue, I think, uh, created a great deal of confidence in the community that there's somebody who's who's there, who's connected, who's well connected to world leaders, uh, and who can help look after them. He doesn't just talk the talk. 
Well, you know, the Canadian government extended a level of cooperation, understanding, help that was absolutely remarkable. Not for the first time in their history, Ismaili Muslims found themselves uprooted. Ismailis are in some ways also like the Jews in that we have no homeland really. You know, our home is where we lay our hats down. This was the first time that an Ismaili community had to recreate itself in the West. This is the, one of the most successful communities that has ever immigrated to Canada. When you have people uh, like uh, the Aga Khan and his followers interested in our country and coming to our country uh, and enriching our country, the winner is Canada. The Ismailis had shown that there was nothing incompatible between their Islamic faith and Western values. The first Muslim to be elected to Canada's federal parliament is an Ismaili. After, obviously, 9-11, when we had, uh, you know, such a, a confusion about Islam, such a confusion about what uh, is the message of Islam, and unfortunate um, uh, images of, of, you know, terrorists uh, being from Islamic background promoting uh, a vision of Islam that I think majority of, us, uh, of people involved in Islam would, would denounce. Three decades later, and the Aga Khan is back in Uganda, at a place where Idi Amin once tortured his victims. The Aga Khan feels very attached to Uganda. He has been here several times. He's meeting His Excellency the President, and they're always talking about investment. Uh, right now, the, they have just invested in the Serena Hotel. The young Aga Khan inherited from his grandfather a billion-dollar fortune and a network of charities, schools, and hospitals. He has continued to build on that legacy. He was coming into a world in which I think we're all starting to become aware that the differences between rich and poor uh, were not going to just continue unaddressed. That. Uh, people in poverty, which were more than half the world, uh, were not going to be silent. Headquartered in Geneva, the Aga Khan's development network has become the main focus for his time and energies. With 70,000 workers, it spends $400 million on development aid every year. The AKDN, the Aga Khan Development Network, uh, is an organization today that's active in more than 35 countries around the world, made up of nine independent but closely cooperative agencies, institutions, and the like. We certainly are led by a prominent Muslim leader, and his ideas and his interpretation of Islam are framing principles for us. They influence the principles all the time and in every way. Uh, and we try to articulate these principles. First of all, we're looking at poverty. The faith of Islam calls on all Muslims who have means to be generous. Please go on, I'm going to join the class. All right. <laughs> His Highness the Aga Khan is a very hands-on manager. We have a living founder who's uh, very uh, directly engaged in the activities uh, of all of the institutions. I mean, he travels extensively. He certainly gets to all or most of the countries that we work in every year. The majority of his time is spent on the road, uh, without any question. It's truly uh, a very heavy load that he carries. Sadly, as the Aga Khan has strived to make the world a better place, the world has taken a turn for the worse.
the collapse of communism in the 1990s enabled him to be reunited with the Ismailis of Central Asia, like these in Tajikistan. As the Cold War has receded, a new challenge has emerged, this time from within Islam itself. It is the threat of extremism and violence that comes with the rise of radical Islam. Terrorists have killed far more Muslims in the name of Islam than they have Christians or Jews. In North Pakistan, so close to the border with war-torn Afghanistan, Ismailis were among the first to come under attack. The main context in which these events have happened has been the war in Afghanistan, Talibanization of Afghanistan, a lot of refugees coming into the, the western part of Pakistan, and just a general ratcheting up of, of the temperature. What happened in Chitral may have been an isolated incident, but it has left a legacy of fear. It started with the rumor that the Smileys had burned a mosque. Uh, this rumor turned out to be a false rumor. Salima's father used to preach at the Ismaili mosque, but her father also ran a hostel for boys of all faiths. The Sunni people had said they were going to burn the hostel in the mosque. They're going to kill the big leaders and burn their houses down. My mother said to my father, the situation is very bad, so don't go to the office. But my father said, I really like my religion, and my father did not listen. My house was up near the river, and on the other side there was a road. They shot a couple of people, and uh, in one case, they threw a live person from the bridge. They say that when they were throwing him down, they said that you become a Sunni and say I become a Sunni, and he refused. And when they were throwing him down, he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, means that I am a Muslim, but not at your command. Eleven Ismailis were killed in the pogrom. The body of Salima's father was never found. And sometimes it feels as if we are losing the battle, that enlightened Islam is proving no match by definition, because we're not hardliners. We're accepting, we're tolerant, we're liberal. By definition, that means we are weak in front of very determined, aggressive uh, foes. When Taliban fighters seized power in Afghanistan, Ismaili's lives were on the line. The Taliban saw all Shia Muslims as heretics and slaughtered thousands. Like other Shias, the Ismailis were under constant threat. In the mosques, under the Taliban regime, people were praying day and night. The Taliban era was one in which they would take people by force to pray. Everything they did was by force. Fundamentalist aggression took to the world stage when Osama bin Laden launched his attacks on the West. The Aga Khan does not believe this is a religious war. They're not driven by faith. They're driven by unsolved political issues. And the understanding of the Muslim world in the non-Muslim world is shallow, and that's a fact. I don't think it's a, a clash of civilization. I think it's a clash very often of ignorance. Would you have said that that ignorance would have led to something like the invasion of Iraq? Uh, I think that would have been a major aspect in the decisions that were, that, were, uh, that were taken in regard to Iraq. I have to tell you that Iraq is not my number one focus. My number one focus is Afghanistan.
The Aga Khan has not given up on Afghanistan. In his jubilee year, he visited Kabul. Many of the children here in this Aga Khan hospital in Kabul are victims of the fighting between Western forces and the Taliban. But the Aga Khan is investing in more than just hospitals and schools. He has also established a cell phone company. It generates 6% of the government's revenue. Significantly, it provides work for women. Certainly in, in some conservative uh, societies, uh, the notion of employing women outside the home is uh, something that um, others take exception to. Do you feel this might be seen as provocative by the more violent fundamentalists? No, I don't think so, because I, I, I mean, yes, there's always a, an extreme group that could, could uh, seek problems. He knows that changing attitudes will take time. Well, I once said to him, uh, Your Highness, I've been in the development business uh, for many years, uh, and I'm struck uh, that you have a long-term view on development. And he said, well, I've been doing this for almost 50 years. You know, it's not instant coffee. Development is not instant coffee. And he said, one thing I've learned is that permanent change, permanent positive change, simply takes time. He does not think in days or months or years. He thinks things in generational terms. It's not a quick fix. Ali, Ali. In the summer of 2007, on the 50th anniversary of his succession, Ismaili delegates came to the estate just north of Paris, where the Aga Khan lives. They came from communities in 30 countries to pay tribute to their imam. For 50 years, the Aga Khan has tried to act as a moderating force within Islam and also as a bridge between Islam and the West. Viewed from a historical perspective, the activities of the Aga Khans to create bridges in many different ways between different communities uh, does in fact come from the, from the experience of a minority community uh, that's been persecuted uh, and having lived in societies that are not able to tolerate difference. The Ismaili have a kind of message for the modern world, which is how to live in a pluralistic world. And that is a message which other Muslim thinkers are rapidly catching up with. The Aga Khan's vision is the only way to go. Extremism is the kiss of death for us all. Moderation and tolerance and thoughtfulness, which are the hallmarks of his life, this philosophy, unquestionably the only way to go. Then how do we build uh, a common humanity? But I think what's important is to hope and, and work for and pray for a cosmopolitan civil ethic, where the unity of the human race becomes a, an ethical purpose for all faiths.